Uh, well, not well. I, I was just going to say real quick before we get started that if uh, if you want to turn your screen on, in this case, we we like to do it that way here because then the presenters can see a response to what they're saying and they can actually feel like they're not just talking at their wall, which I know that can really bum me out sometimes. So if if you feel comfortable doing it, please do it. It's no problem. But um, all right, I'll give a quick uh, introduction here for AltSpace. Uh, Jordan, John, thanks for coming. Really appreciate this. AltSpace is a contagious artist-led engine that undertakes tangible acts of service using art and faith as tools that galvanize impassioned, self-sufficient communities to join in. At a time when past and present injustices spur us to collectively imagine our best future. It's a collaboration between John Veal and Jordan Campbell. Altspace was incepted by the two artists in response to the trauma of surrounding communities and the belief that art could be used as a tool for healing. Campbell's family history of entrepreneurship and Veal's lifelong passion for art met in a resolution to positively disrupt their communities through tangible acts of service. And since its inception, Altspace has expanded into an artist-led Chicago-based nonprofit that is dedicated to revitalizing communities through art and culture. Altspace provides an alternative to the dominant cultural narrative, manifesting new opportunities in a time of need on the south and west sides of Chicago. Guys, I'm just wondering if you guys want to call this Altspace Davenport or am I uh, Am I pushing too far with that? We'll, we'll let it slide today. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm open to it. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for having us. You're welcome. Before we begin, uh, we actually asked a special friend, a special guest to come on the show tonight. Her name is Brooklyn Cole. She is a singer songwriter based in New York City. And uh, you can find her music in Apple and Spotify, and she is going to sanctify the space before we begin. No, thank you for having me, John and Jordan and everyone. Um, I'm going to do an original. It's called Ruby Slippers. Um, I actually did it last time I was in Chicago, so I thought I would do that again. Uh, everyone hear that okay? Yep. I can't seem to figure myself. Raining so high, come sinking to the ground. I click my heels at least four times a day just to see what home is. I don't have the answers, but I guess it's not here because I don't want to stay. Asking where do I go on this road? No one could tell me. What a future brings, just curtains having these insecurities. Gazing at the stars, searching for your heart, just like galaxies, not much too far. Oh, oh, oh. You have this power over me paint the top with your colors like all the leaves once those colors change you follow them into what's unknown the attention they give and your ego showcase how you should have been grown Asking where do I go on my own? No one could tell me what our future brings. Just cut and tie these insecurities. Gazing at the stars, searching for your 
searching for your love, just like I was doing much too far. No words could tell me what a future brings. Just searching for peace and security, sky to the stars. Searching for your love, just like I was doing much too far. Good night, everybody. We can go home. <laughs> this is funny. Thank you guys so much for having me, though. Of course. Brooklyn, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it is always an honor to hear your voice. Um, thank you so much for sanctifying the space before we begin. Um, everybody, it's so good to have you. And with that, guys, we want to just start this off uh, with prayer. Um, I think it's so important for us to continue to bring God to the center, um, especially for John and I, when it comes to our practice, it's imperative that we understand it's through the abundance in which we're given that we're able to, to do the work in which we do. So if we can, let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Um, Father God, we just want to thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for providing uh, the space, not only to listen, but to also be heard. Um, we're praying that we can continue to support one another, Father God, whether it's through artistic practice, whether it's through institutional support, whether it's through uh, just simply uh, being engaged and involved in what's going on in our communities. I pray that this conversation is one that encourages us and, uh, and lifts our spirits up, God, and just uh, leads us towards continuing to do loving and good deeds, Father God. All these things we pray in your son's mighty name. Amen. Great. Uh, so again, thank you guys so much for having us. It's good to be in Iowa virtually. Um, <laughs> so a little bit about me and Jordan. We are artists first and we lead a nonprofit called Alt Space Chicago. But before we dive into any kind of presentation, I think that this format is so unique because, uh, you know, I could see your faces and you guys look like you're really interested in this work. And so I wanted to learn more about you guys and the kind of work that you do. So um, feel free for anyone to just go ahead and jump in. I'm gonna just pick somebody, man. Okay, I can go. Hi, I'm in the basement kind of exercising, so I have my camera off. I the Powell, I teach in the theology department and I don't, I'm not really that artistic, but I appreciate it and I'm excited to hear what you all are up to. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. It's such a great honor to be, I, I love sociology. I used to study sociology myself. Um, I think any artist should be able to understand how people think and where they come from, so. Sorry, uh, it's theology. So I appreciated your prayer earlier. I teach religion and Christianity, yeah. Mm. Hi, I'm Marie. I'm a traditional student and just discovered art in the past couple of years. I've uh, been a nurse and then retired from to the art department at St. Ambrose. I discovered that inside of me there was a heart of an artist and it's been cool just incorporating that into my life as a wife and a mother and seeing the ways that I can beautify the world through my own hands. So I really appreciate the work that you guys do and I'm excited to see how we as an Ambrosian community can beautify our little part of the world thanks to your help. Yay, we love that. That's awesome. And we see, I think we, I think you're working out too. So you gotta yeah, work I'm out. On my, <laughs> I'm on my treadmill too. Let's go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Suzanne. We, I'm an administrative assistant here at St. Ambrose. And I have a son that lives in um, Humboldt Park neighborhood and a, my daughter-in-law works for Breakthrough Urban Ministry in East Garfield Park. So I'm really excited to hear what yes. you're doing there. I was so excited to see that your faith and art together and change in the world. So 
Yay, we, we're very familiar with Humble Park and uh, Breakthrough Ministry. We have some friends who work at uh, Breakthrough Ministry. So that that's awesome. What's that? Yay. I actually just recently moved from Humboldt Park, you know. Um, unfortunately, I love that community so much. Thanks, guys. I think we got room for about what three more. Let's get some guys in there. We haven't heard any of the uh, any of the, the gentlemen. Hi, I'm Jason Senjum. I'm a faculty in management, and uh, I teach social entrepreneurship. So I get a lot of my students involved in the community, and so. Uh, also, one of the things I'm on is um, the uh, economic restructuring group of the Hilltop area, which is the place that St. Ambrose is located in. That's our bubble. That's outside our little bubble here. So uh, I would love it if you guys were doing something that would connect St. Ambrose to the Hilltop area in particular. And uh, I know that we are starting, uh, we have done a couple murals. Um, on Harrison, so there are a couple uh, art projects going on, and it would be wonderful if you guys could do something that would um, tie us closer to that area, because I think a lot of students actually feel afraid to go south of Locust, and so one of the things I've been doing is um, uh, we have this uh, community um, project in the in the fall called urban plunge where we all go to different places and i take my um, students across the street and into the hilltop to get them uh, acquainted with that so that they don't feel scared of that area yeah yeah, yeah. that's a harsh reality but it is one i think that's one of the first ways in which we can solve a problem is recognizing that there is one so that's awesome that you're doing that Thank you for that, uh, Jason. Uh, I'm Joseph. Uh, I'm the current chair of the arts department. So I teach book arts, printmaking, papermaking. I do a lot with uh, community organization, um, getting out into the streets to bring art to um, K through 12 schools uh, and anybody that doesn't have art in their life. I uh, got my master's degree at Columbia College in Chicago, so I spent time at Logan Square and in the Ukrainian village on the far side of Ukrainian village. Uh, did a lot with the You Are Beautiful campaign in Chicago, if you're familiar with them. Of course. Yeah. Um, so that's me. That's exciting. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, I also wanted to share some of these comments that we're getting. Uh, one of them is from Dale. He says, my connection is bad. I'm Dale in biology and I dance and make coll uh, collage cards and books as a hobby, which is amazing. Thank you so much, Dale. And Ella Johnson, she says, I have, or he, I'm not sure, but I have a distracting and loud five-year-old running around, <laughs> but I'm Ella in theology. I love art. No, I'm pretty ignorant about it, smiley face. Aren't we all? Um, we're, we're all just learning about culture as we go along. And so thank you guys so much for coming here, um, sharing a little bit about yourselves. We're gonna get this presentation started um, uh, whenever Chris is ready. And we're just going to it here. I love the humility of this group. It's awesome. Let's go. <laughs> All right, give me one second here. I'm, I'll figure this out. Oh, Chris. Ms. Mary, how many how many miles are you going to get on today? <laughs> Why doesn't it just let me share the desktop now? I don't know. Well, in the meantime, I guess we can look at some of the other chats while Chris is getting that together. So, uh, Carrie said, I'm from the history department. I'm also taking classes at SAU, seeking the minor in art. My hair is dirty. <laughs> I'm on my exercise bike. So, I'll spare everybody that visual. I mean, we have some pretty active participants here today, which is pretty cool. Uh, and one person says, I am, this is Claire. I'm just interloping from Birmingham, New York. 
I am glad to see so many familiar faces. Hello, Sam and Bros, folks. And I'm in Jordan. Thank you, Claire and Carrie, for all this more. I'm a retired architect who attends a lot of uh, kitchen. Catiche Gallery Functions. I hope I said that right. That's from Gail. Let's pop this question. Um, New York pizza or deep dish? <laughs> Let's see what people say. I know it's a tough one. Be careful what you say. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh boy, got a, got a bunch of New York. What's going on? There we go. Oh, somebody said with garlic powder. <laughs> Very specific. Somebody said it's casserole, not pizza. <laughs> Dishes, calories don't count. Somebody said they feel like a traitor to the New York state. I mean, to, to, to my state, but New York. So they must be from Illinois or something. Quad City has its own. Ooh, let's talk about that. So Claire said Quad City has its own style. Actually, Chris mentioned that, I believe. On her. So what's going on with the Quad City's pizza? Who has the best Quad City's pizzeria? Who, who do you guys go to? Guys, I just want to give Christopher a round of applause for figuring this headache out. Superstar going on over here. Just incredible. Curators take note. Are we able to uh, expand it, you know, uh, Chris, to make it on the screen? <clears throat> okay, but it doesn't look, it isn't big enough? It isn't the whole desktop right now or what? So I think in the right hand corner, uh, there's the present button. Oh, hold on. Quick present, oh. Oh, that thing. Okay, got it. I hear you. Okay. Perfect. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. <laughs> nice. And uh, to, to go to the next slide, you could just press the arrows, or I believe you could click. All right, you just let me know. You let me know. Um, but it's good to be here, everybody. Uh, my name is George. Uh, wow. What's my name? Here we go. My name is... <laughs> My name is John Veal. I am a transdisciplinary artist based here in Chicago. Um, and uh, my, my colleague will introduce himself. Yes. Hey, everybody, once again, Jordan Campbell from Chicago. And I am a photographer and also part of Altspace Chicago. Today, we're here to talk about a different kind of faith. Um, and we can go ahead and go to that next slide. So um, I have a question for the group. Anyone can feel free to respond. But I want to hear, what are some of your personal dreams? I'll read the ones from the chat. So one more time, what is some of your personal dreams? in your life. Lisa said, I want to get my book done. If that sounds shallow. No, not at all. Not all at right. all. Gail said, I'm living it. Let's go. I love that, Gail. Cora said, become an art educator. Mm. Gail said, it's true. Uh, Joseph said, art space work for everyone that wants slash needs it. Mm. And said, make a difference. Allison said, to see everyone be able to live a good life. Brittany said, traveling. 
and exploring as much as I can. Christian said to be way beyond COVID. <laughs> um, Christy, a world without hate. Jason Harmony. Uh, Dion, as a fellow Chicago, revitalize the South Side. Sarah, I'm dreaming and working to push our city to be the place that it claims to be. Mm. Accountability. Uh, Megan, I want to be able to show people there is always more to look forward to. Carrie, living wages and health care for all. Mary, I agree with Gail. I'm living my dream of counting to learn and grow and interacting in a positive way with those that I came in with, came in contact with. Ella, to make our campus place where everyone feels like they belong. Sarah, to become a social worker and help everyone. I'm, I'm loving this sense of, of being able to be there for someone else. Um, I'm loving that you want to use your advocacy to be able to further someone else. And even with creating a book, you know, I think about when it comes to an artistic practice, to have faith in an object is to really have faith in people, you know? So the book isn't for you to read because you're writing it, you know, it's really to share your wealth of experiences, to share your images with the world. And so even that in and of itself is about others, which is really encouraging. Um, now, I want to ask the question, uh, what kind of community could foster that growth? For some of these dreams that you guys got going on, what kind of community could foster that growth? Not just with yourself, but within others as well. Where people care about others, Allison. Catherine said, a welcoming and inclusive community. Gail said, tapping into our opportunities as they arise. Mary, a community that is welcoming, non judgmental, and just plain fun. Laura, an optimistic community. Sarah, a community with more voters. Uh, Jason, a connected community. Suzanne, a community that can help show me how to make a difference. Jennifer, a community where everyone's needs are met so that they can flourish. Neoka, uh, optimistic and helpful. Christy, one which sees humanity in others that is a requirement and one that is anti-racist. Lisa, better dis distribution of resources. Alice, love the community that provides, that provides opportunities. Emily, supportive of one another. Laura, cross-cultural community with equal access to resources. Gail, a community where we return to our moral compass. Joseph, a community that believes in creative output as a viable option for all ages, classes, races, gender, and that grow as space. Ella, a community where people are open-minded and wants equality and justice for all. Sarah, communities with more transparency. And lastly, Allison, moral compass, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And we're going to keep this last question as a rhetorical question that we just want on, on your hearts. Um, and part of that is because we want to continue to go back to this question. And then the other part of it is because there's so many comments flooding in. I'm trying to give Jordan a little bit of a break. <laughs> but that last question is, uh, what is the relationship between faith and an artistic practice? And we can go ahead to that next slide. So I want to talk about an artistic practice real quick. Um, so I'm an artist and I believe in objects, but really what that object represents. So what I'm trying to say is that to me, all art is kind of like a lie. Like when I paint a flower, you're not really looking at a flower, right? You're looking at something that the flower might represent. Um, I'm trying to allude to an emotion. I'm trying to allude to something a little bit bigger. And so um, the image to your right, this comes from a performance. So I want to give a little bit of context for this performance. It was uh, about four or five years ago when uh, Trump was running for office and had won the presidency of the United States. And I was mortified, not by the man at the time, but by the values of the country and by the division of the people. 
that this thing that was now in power was a very clear indication of a lack of a of values for another set of people, a lot of different sets of people, whether you're a minority, black and brown bodies, or whether you're um, uh, cis, uh, transgender, or whether you're a woman, you know, this is someone who openly bragged about uh, sexual assault, and he's now president of the United States. And I think there was a this moment in church where I couldn't take another lesson on like the book of Chronicles, right? I couldn't take another lesson on Ruth. like. I the Jesus that I saw in my word didn't he wasn't scared of talking about current issues. He wasn't scared to say what he needed to say directly to the people and directly to the leaders in charge. And I felt like some of the ministers in my church were scared to say certain things because they didn't want to cause a political division. But for me, it's not about political because for me, being black is political. Me walking into a room as a black man, there's notions of how I act, you know, um, there's eyes on me and how I talk and how I interact, you know, whether I code switch or not, right? Whether I go in like, hey, what up though? And, and, and go like this in certain contexts, if I do that in a bank, they're going to look at me a little bit differently than if I do that at church's chicken, right? And so there's a politics of just being a body in space. And so me, Jordan Campbell, and a friend of ours, Chris Calderon, I invited Chris over and we taped his body, you know, for hours and hours, just taking this tape and wrapping around his body. And then within two hours, we were cutting it off of his body in a very uncomfortable process for Chris. <laughs> and then later, well, we, we re-upholstered the body. Uh, with as much paper as we could. And we just wanted to make a black body. And we wanted to take that black body out in public space. It was kind of a social experiment. But it was like, if you see me in a certain way, and I just walk into a room, I want to see how you would treat a random black body. And so I carried around this black body first in Hyde Park, which is a uh, you know, predominantly black community. And just to see the the responses of the people and the questions that they were asking me around this work. And then I took it uh, the same day that Murakami opened up at the MCA, I decided to walk Jerome to the MCA. And it was funny to me because a lot of the people of color immediately understood what I was doing. They would immediately walk up to me and give me daps and like, man, this is, I, I love this. Whatever this is, I'm loving this. You know, what's his name? They, they would ask me for selfies. But a lot of people who were not of color were very uncomfortable uh, with just walking around with this black body. Uh, to the left, you'll see a pillar. And this pillar comes from my last show. It was called Blonde Judas. It's from a poem that I wrote. And the, the I can't remember the entire poem because it was a long time ago in, in Atlanta. But the ending of the poem was, if Jesus had blue eyes, then Judas certainly had blonde hair. And so I was thinking a lot about how we perceive religion within race. You know, this, this idea of a white Jesus, this idea of a white Christmas and a white Santa Claus. You know, I, I think uh, it's interesting, right? You know, how people fight for these things, these symbols, and it kind of distracts from the, the whole. For instance, Santa Claus during Christmas time. Uh, there's a lot of hoopla on Fox News about what color Santa Claus is, but if we're going to be frank, Santa Claus is based on St. Nicholas, uh, which is, you know, he, he lived in Turkey. He's not, he's not, he's, he's Middle Eastern. <laughs> you know, he's not white and he's clearly, you know, he's not black. He's of color though. Um, but it doesn't matter because his ministry was giving. And so I wanted to create this pillar and this pillar represented capitalism. This pillar represented something else, right? It, it represented when you walk up to the bank and it has this perceived notion of power right before you walk into the building. Uh, when you walk into the federal government, you know, in Washington, DC, how the architecture looks separates one with power from one without power, right? And it calls on this Roman Catholic kind of ideology. And I wanted to build this with something that could be broken. I wanted to reveal that this structure is actually very fallible. And during that night with the entire audience, we destroyed this pillar together. Um, it was a little exciting and a little scary because 
you know, this this pillar is like 16 feet tall and we're pushing it over and, and everybody's like super excited to push it over. But I'm, I'm just scared that it's going to crush somebody, you know, some little baby is going to you know, get hit with some cardboard. But to see the energy of the crowd as they started destroying it, ripping apart and just destroying the boxes and the energy of the crowd as they started singing immediately after, not even prompted by me, helps me to understand that it's less about my personal artistic practice and how I feel and putting things out in the world, but it's about this communal practice that we were starting to tap into. We can go to the next slide. This comes from my first exhibition called Black Rivers Steal Away, which is actually based on a W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, The Souls of Black Folk. At the time, I was living on 71st in Yates on the south side of Chicago. So for those who don't know the south side of Chicago, there's a stigma about crime on the south side. I was not... Uh, I didn't see that crime. I saw neighbors helping neighbors. I saw people on the block trying to live, you know, trying to feed their families and they might have to sell something to be able to feed their families. Um, I saw myself getting pulled over by the police at least three times a week. And if Jordan was in my car, you know, and Jordan decided to drive around the block, he'd get pulled over too. Um, and, and at my job, I was required to, to be on the, on the ground floor around all of this black death that was happening. You know, we had exhibitions about black death and the Harlem six and the trauma became a little bit too much for me personally. And so I needed an opportunity to release that trauma. Um, and so it became about a personal mission, something that I believed that I needed to do, right? Something I felt like I was called to do, which I need, I need to express what it means for me to be a, a black body living on the South side of Chicago but it very quickly became less about me and more about the communal living of us. I, I invited Jordan Campbell. I invited Chris Calderon, Starlotta Milian. I invited Monica Benson and Tiffany Berry to join me in conversation um, during this exhibition. And we would come together, we would eat together. We would talk about the work together. We would rehearse our performances and, you know, Jordan Campbell, this is our, when we first started collaborating, honestly, before, before our film in New York, like he came over every single day and he would make me coffee early in the morning, get me ready for work. And then after work, he'd come over and get the whiskey ready <laughs> so we could drink and work on these paintings, you know, um, and have conversations about what it really means to be a disciple and what it really means to be an artist that sometimes God calls us to, to build the boat. And we might not be the ones to, to, to go into that land. We might not be the privileged ones to be able to see the ending of that, but we are called to bring the boat. So that means gathering the wood. So that's what we did. We gathered these people to be able to express something a little bit bigger than ourselves. And I worked really hard with Jordan on some of these paintings. We poured our hearts into it, our money, and we gambled everything. And to see, we gave a knife to audience members and said, we want you to express what you need to express on these paintings. And we took the paintings off the walls. And just to see the audience members, I mean, look at the intensity of this man. It's terrifying. Uh, you know, we, there's a couple times in which it's actually incredible no one got hurt um, just in the heat of the moment. <laughs> um, but to just see that it became about this kind of collective practice that, through these artistic gestures, we were talking about something a little bit more. We were talking about equity. We were talking about culture. We were talking about moving forward together. Um, and I think that's what became really, really exciting in the early stages of alt space. Uh, we can go to that next slide. So around this same time, I became aware of a bird that lives in West Africa. It is called the communal weaver bird. Um, most birds go about their business kind of individually and you know they, they have mating seasons and whatnot and they, they do flock together, but um, the communal weaver birds are, are distinctly interesting to me because they build their nests together. You know, So a group of them will go and grab hay and grab 
uh, twigs and grab grass and they will build this nest together. And there was this understanding that to create a sustainable community for them means a safe space. And that safe space is created together. It's not about this centralized leadership. It's about democratizing that space. And so I think that what we started to look at is, it's not about my practice, but it's about how our conversations, how our dialogue, how our relationships kind of inform a communal practice. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, a lot of us are arts workers in this conversation. And I think a lot of the times that we talk about community engagement, we're really talking about online strategies or, you know, um, tactics to be able to get people to our exhibitions or, you know, get people of color into a room and young people. But I think what we're trying to examine is really just relationships. It's really less about tactics to get people out. It's more about like, hey, uh, this street is dirty. I'm going to get my trash bag out and I'm going to clean up. And if someone comments, I'm going to give them a bag, too. <laughs> if someone's like, man, good job, brother. I'm be like, hey, hey, wait a minute, brother. Hey, here, here go a bag. You know what I'm saying? Because this isn't about me. It's about us, right? Um, and I think that when, when Jesus called people out of the boat, he wasn't just preaching at them. He, he called them to walk with him. And I think that's what these communal weaver birds do. They, they, they walk together in a community. Next slide. So that's where we shift, right? That's where we go down to Savannah, Georgia. This is while John was here up uh, in the north, um, discovering his personal practice that while I was matriculating in Savannah at Savannah College of Art and Design, that uh, after transferring to Claflin University uh, at HBCU studying environmental engineering, that I discovered that is not what I wanted to do nor who I wanted to be. Um, I've been introduced to the camera and I haven't put it down since. And so for me, it was about representation. It was about taking the information in which I was seeing with my own eyes and finding ways to create stories, finding ways to understand what it is that I'm seeing. And for me, this is an iteration of that. And so what I, I was doing was documenting all the abandoned houses in Savannah. Now, Savannah is a beautiful Victorian a historic city. You know, you have New Orleans, you have Charleston, uh, Boston, they're very beautiful and historic cities in terms of architecture. You know, you have cobblestone roads and it's a great port city. But another side of that was that it also took part within one of the crises of, of our nation was of the housing crisis. And so for me, I wanted to examine and understand why are there so many abandoned houses and why do we not talk about the families uh, that once used to occupy these spaces? But at the same time, I wanted to think about how can we revitalize these spaces and transform them into cultural spaces, spaces in which people can, can learn, spaces in which people and culture can be uh, vibrant. And so not only showing them in a way that's typically seen in a disgusting manner, but in a way that it was kind of beautiful. Um, I know there's a, a artist here in Chicago, Amanda Williams, where she does a similar process where she uh, paints houses, uh, these unique colors that are all similar to products that are used um, within the black community. But then you have an artist by the name of Theaster Gates here in Chicago who, who glorified this practice of converting abandoned spaces and dilapidated spaces into cultural spaces, right? Which became Rebuild Foundation. Um, and for me, it was also thinking about the stories behind these doors. You know, as I look at these doors, I'm always curious, like what was taking place, you know, in these houses to make them have to leave, but also what are the stories once they're gone? What's happening to those spaces once people leave? And it's like, we never know. And I'm always curious. And so what I did was simply walk around these communities and ask the neighbors as to what took place. And it was astounding to me because for a lot of them, this whole idea of community has started to decline because they didn't have a neighbor to talk to. There wasn't anyone that you can go to get sugar from or anything like that. Literally, these were all creating these holes within communities that were overlooked. 
And this was kind of the foundation for me coming into Chicago. Oh, I'm not controlling the slides. So Chris, can you push it? <laughs> I'm over here clicking like, uh, it's not working. <laughs> and so long story short, I uh, graduated in 2014. I moved to Chicago uh, 2014, three days after my graduation. I had watched a documentary called Chirac, brought me to tears. I prayed to God like, hey, what can I do? And he didn't stop me. So I moved here. Um, with the mission to utilize my gifts as a, a, as a photographer to tell the stories of, of marginalized, disenfranchised communities, but also to bring about unity within a, a very segregated city that has a rich history of, of corruption and, and death and all that. So I became a teacher at uh, Austin Career College Academy on the west side of Chicago. Now, the thing about this school is they have a huge turnover rate. At the time when I went there, there were only 16 teachers on staff with over 300 students. Now, for me, this was, it was kind of astounding. It was crazy to me to think about because a lot of the kids were now losing their trust within their teachers because there were so many teachers coming in and out, in and out, in and out. There wasn't this consistency. And so this played in the way they thought about themselves. And I, I knew this personally because I would have conversations with my students. And so for me, it was about how can we talk to each other, but at the same time, how can we highlight the beauty of who these kids are and listen to them? Because it's not only about us teaching, but it's also about us learning when it comes to being educators. Um, and so this project that I did with my students was simply to combat this idea uh, about identity, right? and impressions. And so for me, I noticed, I'm not really big on social media, but what I recognize is that we have this culture of, of kids who are afraid to see themselves and show themselves uh, or, or to be photographed, even some adults as well. Cause I went around and asked every staff member if I could take their photograph. And they're like, uh, you know, come back to me next week, which, which ended up to next month, which ended up to never. <laughs> But the students were, were reluctant to take these photographs. But what I shared with them was, what I'm going to capture is the impressions in which you've made upon me as your teacher. And so what I, I just asked them to just simply sit there on the stool, black backdrop, natural light, and this was the result of that. And I call this lasting impressions because these kids have had an impression upon my life even though I only taught them for six months, that I was reminded, I could continually reminded of their stories. Um, and I mean, they're, they're, they're beautiful and handsome kids. And it, it's, it, uh, it's just amazing. It's amazing. Oh, next slide, I can't, I can't click. <laughs> and so from there, as I was teaching at, uh, Austin, I continued to work with uh, other nonprofits throughout the city. Um, we all live here, work with uh, Rebuild Exchange, of course, and Sweetwater Foundation, Elevated Gardens, Little Village, and all these organizations are dispersed throughout the city. Because for me, it was about creating this map and this connection of, of how do we tell these stories? But how do we do this in a way into which we can unify these organizations through me? Literally, I was like, my goal is to figure out ways, because when I'm having conversations with one organization, they're like, oh man, we, we need this, or we need that. And I'm like, well, hey, have you talked to so-and-so from this organization because they're doing something similar? And so this is literally what happened when we did this project called uh, We Are the Cub of the Earth Exchange. And this exchange was between Little Village, um, which is a predominantly Hispanic uh, community or Latinx community here on the west, more so towards the west side of Chicago, and then Inglewood on the south side of Chicago, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, and so what we did was this exchange. Um, the idea behind this exchange was bringing together these different cultures and different backgrounds of experience within gardening and farming to teach them the differences and the practices in which they all had individually. 
And so it was so beautiful to see these kids and families coming together to learn the different practices and like, oh, this is how we grow corn or this is how we do it. And, and at the end of it, we had a celebration. It was a moment to celebrate this exchange, but most importantly, to highlight these relationships that had never been developed because you have people who would never leave one side of the city to go to the other. Like there was no need. And at the same time, there's such a stigma to where people don't even want to go to certain parts of, of, of our city. And so this exchange, even though it was small in stature, was the smallest number was huge in stature. And so then it led to one of my favorite photograph series that I've done as, as one of the co-founders was when we did this exchange, uh, well, registration with Nike. We're going to talk a little bit more about it. But for me, it was one of those... I would say it wasn't the primary focus of that event, but one of the secondary focuses, which was highlighting family again. And so this was a photograph that I took of one of the families who, who had come to get registered to vote, but they brought all their kids. They had all sons and the kids were, were, were afraid to come to the truck to ask for the, the toys and the things that we were giving away. But this was to me a reflection of not only what's happening to kids, but also what's happening to communities that they're afraid to step out and seek help and to seek things that they want and desire because of the suppression, because of the, the fear of being vulnerable and, 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 and not taken care of, which they have a right. That has happened over history and over time. And so to photograph this was to me to highlight this moment that all it is about is truly providing those resources. And as somebody talked about in the chat, you know, truly being about what we speak about, you know, literally living it out. And so we've been able to do that when we talk about bringing different resources to communities for people to share and to be dispersed throughout our communities has happened and it continues to happen. And this photograph was as one of those moments that highlighted that for me. Chris, you can go to the next slide. And now we begin. This is a, a super important image right here. Um, you know, in 2015, the New York Times uh, declared Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in North America. You know, um, you see all those little blue dots. That's where black people are. <laughs> um, I like how they separated it by race. You know, um, the orange is where Hispanic is. The red is where Asians are. You know, that's predominantly right there is Chinatown. Um, the green is 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 white you know and caucasian americans they're predominantly on the north side and you know in the loop areas uh and then you have the other um always trying to speak to the other but we know that this is not an accident you know this comes from redlining in the 70s you know this comes from city planning this comes from discriminatory practices of banks when it comes to lending for black and brown families um you know there's a, there's a a compounded effort uh, throughout generations to keep black and brown folk and women from these levels of equity and success, right? And so, you know, you have things like the Greeny Green projects. Uh, I mean, Good Times was based on the projects in Chicago, you know, like it's historic um, as to like, there's this group of people that we don't wanna be around. So we're gonna create a highway from the loop to the suburbs, which is actually factual. So this is just a little bit of history from Chicago that's a little bit different from the stories about Michael Jordan and Oprah um, that we all know about, but me and Jordan live in, right? Like we see it every day as you drive from this, uh, this part of the city to another part of the city. And, you know, it's interesting on the west side of Chicago, you know, you have Austin, which is a predominantly black community. And, at, you know, it's, it's where alt space works out of right and so you have this predominantly black community and you're walking on the street and you see nothing but garbage and litter and abandoned spaces um you might even feel a little unsafe because of the type of people that are attracted to abandonment um you know and you might feel a little unsafe walking around at night until you cross the, the block and you get to oak park which is a predominantly white community and there's lights on every corner. You know, there's a garbage can on every block. Uh, there are no abandoned buildings. And there's this, a, a completely different shift, but it's from one block literally to the next. 
Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I know that you guys probably have those same uh, city discrepancies uh, that we are definitely, we're super excited to come and visit you guys in Davenport within these next couple of months. Um, but we, we started to, to look at these things um, and see the funerals. Uh, and we just felt like the exhibition wasn't enough, you know, yeah. like we, we're really good at what we're do what we do. We, we can make a painting, we can make a photograph, but the people who came to the exhibition started to just come for, for the show. Right. And it started to feel like a little bit of, a uh, 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 what do they call them? Gosh, it started to feel a little bit like black exploitation. It started to feel a little bit like a menstrual show. In the sense of like, you know, I'm here to dance, shine shoes, and you know, a little bit of, you know, exploiting the the traumas to being able, instead of being able to solve some of these traumas, instead of being able to like how do we how do we take stuff from the gallery to take it to the street? And so we started to to collaborate together, me and Jordan. And we said, you know, we have to be a little bit bigger than artists individually. Like, we need to create a system in which we'll be able to not just talk about these things, but being able to act, right? Because the Bible talks about, you know, don't just listen to the word, do what it says. You know, that's that's in James. Um, and so that's what we decided to do. We came up with this nonprofit called Altspace. Uh, we can go to the next slide. You're the man, Chris. So... There are these things, right? Uh, you know, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And these are the things that you guys were talking about. When we asked you guys what your dreams were, a lot of those dreams fit right into here, right? Like uh, your basic needs, right? To being able to feel safe, being able to have access to food and water, uh, psychological needs, like being able to have esteem, uh, you know, relationships, self-actualization needs, you know, being able to feel like you have value. Um, we understand that a lot of people don't even have their basic needs in black and brown spaces. A lot of people, I mean, we talk about it all the time in the news, right? Like Flint, Michigan don't got water. Why don't they have water? Um, that is a basic human need that we all had the right to. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, reclaiming our communities with our narratives. I'll have Jordan speak about Project Stamp. Yeah, so this was a continuation of recognizing those needs. And one of those needs is, is positive representation with the community. Um, so that means we had to cross these bridges. That means we had to take these projects and initiatives, not only to black communities, but to also you know wider communities and more affluent communities. Uh, and talk about these narratives, talk about the stories, talk about the people in a different light. We understood that the media is not going to cover the positive news. They're going to cover the drama. They're going to cover the most deaths that take place and things of that nature and highlight that. You know, to be honest, we, we, we like drama. But when it comes to people's lives being at stake, uh, that's not what we want to represent. That's not what we want to continue to have shared uh, within our communities and about who we are as a people. So this is our, our, our project stamp, which was all about archiving the narratives and the stories of people from the Austin community. Um, and there was a need for this because we saw all these different billboards and ads to sell alcohol and other systems of dependency and, and things of that nature that who was highlighting and telling the stories of the actual people who live here? Why aren't their voices being heard? Why aren't their faces being seen? to show like, hey, these are the greatest assets, assets of this community, but yet they're not being represented. And so we wanted to first figure out a way to engage them by inviting them to a party. <laughs> so we did a huge get together of music, food, um, all of that, and most importantly, free photo shoots. You know, who, I mean, me and John both grew up going to Sears, J.C. Uh, with our families, you know, getting those, you know, photos with Santa and all that jazz. And so we were like, hey, we should do the same, but do it in a more elegant way. Let's bring some really beautiful furniture and have these people feel like queens and kings in their own communities, which they are. But then let's use those abandoned spaces 
that we see all throughout this community of Austin, being that there's over 5,000 abandoned houses and buildings within Austin community. How can we change them and reshape them with our own stories? And so that's what Project Stamp was. It was about simply stamping our identity within our own community. So when people pass through, they don't see abandonment, they don't see vacancy, but they see neighbors. They see actual people instead of emptiness. And so the way we saw this was not only just vacancies, but spaces of opportunity. We can go to the next slide. And so this is another iteration of it. John and I were driving <laughs> one day. Um, we have these really impulsive moments. Uh, once again, yes, we are artists. So we uh, were driving underneath the train tracks near the Dan Ryan, which is the highway John referred to that literally separated, uh, brought the people from the suburbs into the city. You know, this was the highway that literally broke up black communities that were predominantly on the south sides uh, to create an in and out passageway uh, for, for suburbia. Um, so right here is this underbody of the train, that's the green line actually. And John and I driving past, I think John was like, man, we, we should put something there. Uh, and there's a huge billboard that's next to it. And he's like, man, we should put something there. And I was like, you're right, we should. And next thing you know, a couple hours later, he and I get a team together, Jasmine Benitez and Priscilla, uh, some of our volunteers, and we create this huge project stamp, right? Of this gentleman who came to sit with us. Um, and here it is. We created this large installation, put solar lights so at night you can see it when you drove past. But most importantly, it was the highlight that yes, you are the light of the world. It's a statement that is a fact. We all have influence. We all are positions of leadership, whether you're a mother, whether you're a brother, whether you're a sister, whether you're a teacher, uh, you just being a civilian, you know, an everyday average civilian, there's people who look to you and you are a light to someone or something. And so we just wanted to highlight that. Uh, and John can share more about this story. Yeah, I think the only other thing I'd say is just, you know, um, there are, there are these public spaces, right? At least they're said that they're public, but they're either government signage or it's trying to sell you something. Fun fact, 90% of the visual information you take in is advertisements. And so, you know, we took all of these beautiful photos of our neighbors. You know, we're not trying to sell you anything. If anything, we're just trying to show you who you are, which is that you're beautiful, that you're brilliant, um, and that this public space should be a little bit more public. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to quickly kind of touch on how we think about community in this slide. So typically, we, you know, you might think of community within your zip code, right? So your next door neighbor and what's going on. But I think that, you know, community is really just shared values, you know, are we able to agree that we want a safe space for our kids, that everyone deserves a little bit of education and the opportunity to progress, you know? And with that, we rethink assets. So when me and Jordan look at a building and it's abandoned, we're like, how can we redeem this space? You know, like there's a little bit more life in this, in this building. And, and the reason why is because how we treat buildings is indicative to how we typically treat people. You know, so if I work hard to restore this abandoned space, it actually communicates something about my belief in the people who live here in this community. But I can't do this alone, and neither can Jordan, uh, even though Jordan does a lot. So we need to collaborate, right? We need to bring in a lot of other people with many other skills because, you know, it shouldn't be one person's responsibility to revitalize an entire community. It's it's that's not even fun. You know, that's that doesn't even make sense. Uh, it should be if you have a healthy community, you have a theater, you have a park, you got a school, you got, you know, the fire station, you know, all these things work together in this symbiotic relationship. Uh, so everyone, every part has to play its part that only that part can play. Uh, and then with that, we we try to democratize 
beauty, right? A beauty isn't just for this type of people that live by the loop, right? Where all the museums are. That beauty can be seen by your next door neighbor. You know, that the, our belief in the artists in our community is as strong as our belief in the artist in the world. So we can go to the next slide. So speaking about this, these are some of the issues in which we focus on as an institution. Uh, being that Black Lives Matter has been something that's been shouted, but it's not just a, a statement, it is a reality, it is a fact. And so for us addressing that issue that it doesn't, and it isn't a reality, is one of the key things we focus on. Uh, food deserts, uh, the newest addition to this whole thing has been coronavirus, uh, police brutality, unemployment, um, in our environment, and all these things we look to address and tackle as an organization. So we don't like to just do one-offs. You know, we like to kill two birds with one stone. So for example, when you're looking at Project STEMP, it's about using underutilized spaces, but also talking about Black Lives Matter, but also focusing on how do we engage and employ other people as well? Because we had interns and we put people to work when we're doing these forms of engagement. Um, and so right now we even have a great team that we're working with. And like I said, Jasmine and, and um, Priscilla were volunteers, but this allows for them to get that experience of doing things and learn skills that they can add to their own resumes. And that's a key part about what we do as an organization is truly being that platform, right? And so when we're thinking about community, even with the St. Ambrose community, we understand that your community is very similar to Austin, right? In Austin, there's about 100,000 population, just like St. Ambrose, right? And so it's like, how do we look at these two similarities and understand you guys have a 73% uh, white population to our 90% population, black population? It's kind of flip opposite. So there's things that we're going to have to learn from one another that we can utilize to build those bridges, to create those changes within our own communities and St. Ambrose community, right? And that kind of ties back into what we were talking about before with these weaver birds, figuring out what are the things that we can all add and bring to these tables together to build something that is inclusive and reflects the actual entire community and not just one single part. We can go to the next slide. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, I know time is starting to run short. And thank you guys for hanging with us so far. But the the death of of George Floyd hit hard. Uh, George Floyd, uh, you know, uh, it it wasn't shocking, but at the same time, it was completely shocking. Uh, same with Breonna Taylor, you know, and so many others. And Chicago took it hard. You know, there was a mass looting on the south and west sides of the city, and so. You know, it was already a struggle to get toilet paper, you know, I'm saying in March because of the coronavirus, you know, you already had to only take one thing home and now your local grocery store was gone, you know, and it's like, where does the, the neighbor who's in the wheelchair, where do they go? You know, now that the grocery store is gone, they don't have access to a car. And so uh, me and Jordan were walking through our city and, uh, you know, at the same time, you have tanks rolling through, you know, fully automatic guns walking around, you know, with these soldiers. And uh, I think that that was our Nehemiah moment of seeing our city kind of on fire. And there's this, this deep desire to rebuild the wall. Uh, not the wall that America talked about, the Ameri you know, the wall Nehemiah be talking about. Uh, next slide. <laughs> America talking about some crazy walls. So, uh, this was our response, you know, our response, you know, July 5th, we decided to post on Instagram, really, you know, that, hey, guys, there's people in need. Can we got, can we get your help? You know, can 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 we organize in a, another kind of way to be able to respond to the needs? And within a day, we were able to raise over a thousand dollars. And with that, we were able to make 650 care packages, over 650 care packages filled with food, water, tissue paper, uh, feminine products, um, you know, toiletries to be able to give to the community. And not only that, but during the pandemic, we were able to have 100 volunteers, you know, 50 on the south side and 50 on the west side. And it was a beautiful moment. 
of just unity of people from all races and all cultures and all colors saying, you know, we, we, we want to believe in something more. We want to be there for one another. And we loved that we were able to organize so quickly. At the same time, we started having a little bit of a conundrum because immediately after that event, uh, people were hitting us up like we were a food company and like all these different food companies wanted to give and all these different initiatives started to happen. And, you know, we just wanted to be very clear to people. Hey, guys, we're not activists. Uh, we're not a food company. We're we're artists. <laughs> right. Um, and, and at the same time, we couldn't do another care package giveaway like that. Because it took us, a, you know, a couple days to get that started, but other organizations were doing it consistently every single day, sometimes even twice a day. And so instead of us reinventing the wheel, how do we move that wheel forward? So we started to think about the system of food in the sense of, you know, I might have some sugar and you might have some flour. What if we just rethink about how we interact with one another as neighbors? What if we think about how we share and so that's how we came about alt space market which is a communal free market where members of the community can give and take thus creating a temporary communal shared economy we can go to that next slide show them show them what's up so this is the first alt space market this is how we decided to celebrate juneteenth um we took this abandoned space in austin that had not been serving people for a long time. And we just asked a couple of our friends to join us. They didn't know what we were doing. We just we just said, hey, come, come help us out. <laughs> and we decided to put some shelves. You know, we, we reclaimed this wood. You know, we got this wood, we shined it up and cut it nice. And uh, we decided to create a market and put things on this market where we would encourage neighbors to take and give whenever they had the opportunity to do so. And I think the blessing was to see that neighbors came up to give hair weave, you know, like for the sisters, you know, like that, you know, other neighbors came up to give laundry detergent. Other neighbors came to take because they needed it so much and they were just so grateful. Another neighbor came up just to pray. Um, he was just so, so grateful for everything that was happening. Um, and we did this with only $250. And so, being able to see how this blew up. I mean, we put this on Instagram and it went from 20 likes to 3000, like in a couple hours, which was kind of overwhelming. And so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it got 3000 likes, you know, a uh, hundred comments, you know, you, you start to realize, okay, people responding to this, um, but we have to be responsible with this as well. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of people, a lot of the comments were focused on where is this? You know, where what's the address? What's the address? And me and Jordan were up at two in the morning, both of us asking the same question. And the question was, do we give them the address? And so I called Jordan and it was encouraging that he was thinking about the same thing. We're, we were thinking about the history of art when it comes to gentrification um, displacement. and displacement. And that, you know, if we give the address, there's there's a way in which this might be an opportunity for people to come and take pictures with poor people and say that they did a good job for the day. And so we decided, you know, to piss people off. We decided to say, you're not allowed to have the address because it's not for your tourism. It's not for anyone's tourism. It's, it's for the people of this block and the people of this block can share. Yeah. And it was simply about protecting the integrity of this community. It's like when you're going through issues, you don't broadcast that. You don't put that out on for everybody to see. You don't put it on display. And so for us, it's like, how do we protect them, but at the same time still get those resources in so that their needs can be met? And so that came through partnerships. That came through understanding, like, this installation uh, that we created was not just one act. This was something that was created for sustainability that was going to be sustained through empowering the community in which it's placed within. And so that meant canvassing, that meant connecting with the community, asking them about some of the needs that they had, asking them how long were they there for, asking them like, hey, is there certain things that you want to bring to this wall that we can make sure if, if you don't have it, we can get it. Um, and figuring out the partners who will be appropriate 
to, to partner with us for the specific communities in which these locations, these sites were located. But lastly, I would go to add is that, you know, this is something that the Aster has said um, in one of his talks was that, you know, there's times to create work and then there's times to, to create a movement. And I think this was a time for us to not create just another mural, but it was to create a movement. It was to create an action that required the involvement and the inclusivity of the communities in which it was in, uh, involved in. We, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this became kind of our workforce development, you know, uh, immediately after the first market uh, rebuild foundation on the south side asked us to come build one for their community. And uh, the south side is, 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 is family, just like the west side is for us. And so this time we asked the entire block to come help us build it. And they came, you know, and it rained a little while, you know, and, and that was cool too, because we had drummers out there. And so it was like, they brought down the rain, you know what I'm saying? It was like that Prince moment at the Super Bowl. Um, but it was really cool just to being able to teach about how to cut plexi you know, how to drill in with uh, the wood and reimagining the space, understanding that the space, uh, this abandoned space is actually yours. Um, at the same time, understanding that this is completely illegal and this is kind of our gangster stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't got rights to this building, but at the same time, we're not gonna let this building not serve the community. We're gonna be radical in how we, we think about it. And so we just take responsibility and we decide to use this as an, a teachable moment to how to work with these tools so you're not scared of these tools and you can reapply this kind of thinking. Once you understand how to use a tool, you can build whatever you want. You can go build some benches, you can go build trash bin, you can go build a, a door, you can go build a house. Um, and so, and it was just joyful, man. It was just such a good time to be with so many friends and neighbors and, and understanding that this can be our business model to continue to put people, artists to work reimagining how to apply their skills. Next, we can go next slide. Uh, yo, this is super yeah. cool. <laughs> so this, this is another iteration of the idea that community goes beyond just who's around you, but it's more about a, a set of values. And so we saw this set of values we lived out within California, Inglewood, California. Um, and so right here, John and I were able to go to that actual location in Inglewood to see our market, you know, that somebody had designed based off of our designs here in Chicago. And so for us, when we think about St. Ambrose, we want to really think, really think, what's the identity of your community? What are the key things that make St. Ambrose St. Ambrose and what makes Davenport Davenport, right? We know Dred Scott was there uh, in the 1800s during the time of, you know, freedom of slaves and how he was advocating for that, but at the same time being denied. So it's like we have these rich histories that take place, that have taken place within Davenport that we can really tap into. And so we, we want to continue to think about these things when it comes to Davenport and San Bro. We can go to the next slide. So, uh -huh. so yeah, I know John probably want to share, but I want to tap into it real quick. So we, um, we were able to take our, our, our brains and figure out how can we get involved in this year's election. And so for us, that meant not just sitting there with our, our twiddling our thumbs. We said, okay, we want to help people get registered to vote. Um, at first, we were afraid to due to the fact that we didn't want to get too politically involved. You know, as a nonprofit, you can't unless you uh, are simply focusing on helping people register or to just partake within that system. So. We said, okay, what we can do is activate our markets. And so we did that and we partnered with Nike and they outfitted a truck that we took all over the city um, and helped people to register to vote. And we were able to get 560 people registered to vote and at the same time engage more than a thousand to tell them where they could go vote because all these places were closed. I don't know if you guys experienced that there in Davenport, there was a lot of places that changed their hours when you could vote, where to go vote. And this was an issue because we had populations of people that have already been suppressed in terms of their voting. But now with the pandemic, it just amplified that. And so it was like, how can we provide information and disseminate that information so people can exercise their right to vote? And so that's what this was about. 
the only thing I'd say before we go to the next slide is that, you know, uh, thirty percent of people within black and brown communities do not have regular access to the internet, uh, which affects your communication. It affects education as kids have to do virtual Zoom meetings for school. Um, and so the original idea was to outfit the markets with Wi-Fi, so that when people walk past the market, they'd be able to, you know, get online. Um, unfortunately, because we don't own the buildings, Nike was a little scared to illegally to do that. <laughs> so that's when we decided to outfit a truck. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Shout out to John's parents. That was, that was his parents on that photograph. Um, this is CLAY. Uh, it is our educational programming. Uh, it stands for Creating Live Art for the Youth. Um, it is really a focus, you know, when COVID-19 hit, uh, our class that was dedicated on teaching kids how to reimagine their collective future had to transform into, you know, everyone has a phone, so let's just do a photography class, you know, and teach about angles and shape and form and, and narrative. And we were able to partner with a local arts organization called 60 Inches from Center to get our kids published and paid. And uh, I'm happy to say it was their top 10 most read articles of 2020. Um, so our kids were killing it. And lastly, I'll just add that when we approach uh, the community there, we're going to want to focus on how can we create this education uh, platform, you know, to work with the younger generation because it's important for their voices to be heard as well. You know, a lot of times when you turn on the TV, you see people our age. Well, you know, John and I are still young, but but yeah. <laughs> So we, we, we don't see representation of the younger uh, generation. I think it's so important that we include them. And so we want to create this council or, or something that would allow for us to provide a space for them to participate in anything that we do when we come there as well. Yeah, I think it's important to say that when we come and visit Iowa, um, that everyone's going to be invited to the table because it is our table, right? It's everyone's table. Yeah, and that yeah. me and Jordan at that moment, we're just we're just guests, man. We're, we visiting. We we chilling. You know, we're just trying to learn more about you guys at the same time, helping to use whatever talents we have to uplift you, because that's what alt space is. Right. Like the some of you guys on your computers right now have an alt space. Um, but by itself, if you press that button, it can't do anything. It needs another component to do anything. And I think that's how our organization works is that by ourselves, we can't do much, but with another component, we can do anything. So we can go ahead and to that next slide. Yeah. That's it. That's it, man. We, we was gonna pray out, but before we do, man, we wanted to take some questions from you guys as to anything you guys want, any direction you wanna pull us in. Folks, uh, go ahead and un un unmute yourself and ask a question if you'd like, or throw it in the chat window, either way. I'll just, I'll just real quick say one thing. Um, I was wondering about um, you know, seeing those photographs that you took from the, uh, from, the, from the school with the high turnover rate, Jordan, that you were working at, um, the photographs of the children, I, you know, that evolving in the project stamp, but I could also see that being the kind of thing that we do work with K through 12 students here in the Davenport schools, if not Quad City schools. And I uh, really respect and uh, completely agree with that notion of taking that energy out into the community and making it happen for real as a movement. But then I think that could be folded right back into having an inviting space for these students to come here and recognize that this school is for them as well. You know, I mean, that's the thing is really getting, you know, a better, uh, more diverse um, uh, employment here and also a more diverse uh, student body. And that starts with K through 12 students coming here, recognizing that this space is theirs as well. And how better to do that than to see them photographed and up on the walls in the gallery here. It just came to mind. I thought, well, that, that, that could be one of the ways in which we start. I think that's a great um, take from, from that, Chris, because like, 
like I said before, and as John was saying, we just want to understand that this is not something where we're not going to be able to do on our own. And I think when we talk about community, we have to, to include every part of that community. So yes, that includes the kids, that includes the elders of that community, that includes the youngsters, you know, that includes the middle aged folks of the community who are the engine of those communities. And so in terms of creating this system, it's got to have a theme, it has to have a focus, but we need to include every single part in order for that to be lived out. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that uh, comment. I was wondering, uh, this is Joseph. Uh, I was wondering uh, when you were uh, creating uh, public art that may have been less than legal, like, what you, uh, like, how did you, was it something that you did um, within the two of you and your group, or did you reach out to the community and say, hey, we're going to do this, we could use a lot of help, by the way, this is something that could be destroyed or could be, like, um, you know, the, the people come around and say there's something wrong with it, uh, but we're going to take this energy on ourselves as the artists. I was just wondering how you have kind of dealing with that sort of element of, of public art. For sure. So, uh, so right now there's four markets in Chicago. Um, and I'll say that, you know, I know Jordan wants to answer as well, but for the first market, um, you know, we, it was just a small group of our friends that we asked to come through and help us out. And the neighbors came and joined in, you know, which was really awesome. Um, they saw what we were doing and they came and joined. Now, when you're building in community, a level of risk there's a level that you got to expect and uh it was attacked once um we came to the market and the plexi that we created to protect books and bread was you know there was a remy bottle that was smashed over it um and, and there was glass everywhere but how we found out about it was a neighbor called us you know and said hey something happened you know like you know there's this guy in the community and he's been a little mental uh he's got some stuff going on and uh you know we 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 think he attacked the market last night and she, Miss Jordan was out there with the broom, sweeping it up. Uh, and then me and Jordan went out the next day and put in some new plexi because we understand that, you know, mental illness is, is definitely a thing, man. And, and that that's going to happen. But I'll, I'll say with, um, our last market that we just did, which is a women led market, um, you know, that we had very little to do with just, just general counsel really. Um, uh, we were invited to that space and they own the space. So there's a lot more that, you know, legality there. But with the other spaces, you know, it, it was it was more like, this is what we feel we're called to do. Yeah. I would go to add to that, that, you know, when we were doing Project Stamp, uh, there were multiple times when the police would drive by and give us thumbs up, high fives upon <laughs> us installing. We never got any questions because, once again, when you're doing beautification to a community, what what are people going to, what's their opposition? Um, and at the same time, one of the markets was even protected by the police here in Chicago, uh, in Inglewood. And once again, we don't have any type of clearance, you know, we need to get clearance on these spaces. There was no one to call. You call the city, they're like, oh, we don't know who owns it. We, like, that's the thing that we found out about most of the spaces in which we did our installations on, is that we don't know who owned it. We don't know who owned these spaces. There's numbers that lead to nothing. So it's like, okay, well, since nobody's using this space, we're going to commandeer it, and we're going to make the spaces for our community to use it. Um, I would go to say that, of course, those are concerns for us as we created these spaces. But for us right now, we can't be worried about that when there's a fire, right? And I want to use this analogy because I think that's what it's truly about for John and I, was that when there's a fire going on, you don't ask somebody how much water you're going to use to put it out. You don't ask them what kind of bucket. You don't ask them none of those questions. Your concern is for them to simply put this fire out because my property is being destroyed or somebody's life is going to be taken. And that's the extreme level to which we are at right now. That these communities, people are dying 
day in and day out from from not from malnutrition, from violence, and the list can go on. And so for us, it's just a simple, we need to respond. And this was the way in which we did it. But I think, of course, working with the institution of your stature, I'm sure that we're going to have to approach things a little bit differently. And John and I are definitely welcome to that. But at the same time, we still want to understand that, hey, we're not here to just build, you know, gain new friends in, in Davenport. We really want to do some work here in, in that community and build lasting change that will, will live beyond our lifetime and, and, and beyond your own lifetime as well. The last thing I'll say is that for these spaces to work, me and Jordan immediately recognized that we didn't have the resources to keep the food going, right? Like we didn't have the money to restock the shelves every single week. Um, so we partnered. We asked community partners to, to join us in the work. And so each market has two to three community partners, like the Austin one has Grocery Run Chicago, Compound Yellow, the Southside Rebuild Foundation, you know. And what they do is not only do they monitor the cleanliness of the market to make sure it's not, you know, becoming a, a shanty town, but they also restock the shelves and coordinate with neighbors to make sure everything's going well. And so um, that's important because it's not just about us, right? And I think the same when we come to Davenport, if market is needed, um, or any type of public work is needed, that partnership uh, between private and public partnerships is necessary. Chris, thank you for that question. I mean, I'm sorry, Chris, I said Chris. Joseph, thank you for that question. I just want to say, Ms. Mayor is still going strong over there. Oh my gosh, let's go. <laughs> You're killing it. We love it. We love it. <laughs> I've been super jealous of that. I've been super jealous this whole like hour and a half. She's, she's not even sweating. I don't she sweat. <laughs> do it. I feel like I am sweating. <laughs> so I'm really excited about um, the prospect of working with you guys to do something to um, really put a bond and an interaction between Davenport and St. Ambrose community. And um, it's really encouraging. So thanks for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let me just jump in and really quick say, um, if anyone has ideas as we get started, I mean, John and Jordan are going to visit sometime soon. Nothing's been worked out yet, but sometime soon. And I've been looking into funding and, you know, uh, been talking with other faculty about where we can go with this. But if anyone has ideas for partners in the community or um, can offer uh, potential spaces or, or community stakeholders, please reach out to me and um, we'll, we'll get this started. I know the, um, the Figgy Art Museum is very excited about all of this. Just took lots and lots of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, yeah, uh, our outreach program, but even what we could be doing in house. I mean, there's all wonderful things that are possible. So, that's awesome. Thank you. Laura. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. There's so much love in this room, and there's so many people working out in different capacities. It's, it, it's, uh, this is awesome. All right. Well, we'll, we'll wrap up here. Uh, does anyone have a, a question or comment they want to make? And we can, uh, we call the night here on a Friday. I, I think my last comment would be just, it's really neat to be able to realize that there's more that we as a community can agree on than things that we disagree on and highlight those things with our work. Yeah, yeah, amen. I did wanna say something before we prayed it out. Um, I'm just so grateful that we're having this conversation, guys. I know what I've learned is talking about race and sexism, discrimination, and all that is very uncomfortable. But for you guys to sit and for us to be able to share this thing with you, and, and I look forward to it not just being a one way conversation to where we're presenting to you, but that we can listen to you all on different topics and learn from one another. Um, because I think that's important that these conversations we had so we can inform us on how we need to navigate space and things as well. And so we just want to say we are so grateful that you guys have created space for us to, to be heard today.
Great. Well, I think with that, guys, uh, you know, Chris, if you don't mind, I, I you know, we just wanted to pray it out. Um, and you guys just, you know, enjoy your weekend. So, um, Lord, we come before you just super grateful to be able to be in this work together. Uh, we're grateful, Father, that there, you know, there's a lot of pain in this world. There's, there's COVID-19. There's a lot of death. Uh, you know, politics is a mess, <laughs> but we're grateful that you blessed us with one another. And we're grateful that you blessed us a vision for the future. Uh, we pray, Father God, for this collaboration, not just between uh, Jordan, myself, and uh, university, but between the cities of Davenport and Chicago, that we can come together as neighboring cities uh, with a, a unified vision for equity for all. And uh, we are just so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, we pray that you bless us with a safe weekend. In Christ we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Well, thank you guys so much. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jordan. Everyone, I will I will have this posted once it downloads back to me. I'll post it on the page and send out the link to everyone. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Have a blessed evening. Bye.